Well, he's not technically here until I introduce him, so you don't see him right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got it. Announcements. Fred has was on a couple of the very first low car cruises way back when. I was so excited when we got him to come back for us. So we are thrilled to have you with us. It's we had here. I am excited to hear from Fred. Fred has been involved with exercise ever since he became a member of the Charles Atlas Club when he was 10 years old. He developed the slow burn system as a physical therapy aid at the Hospital for Joint Diseases Sports Medicine Center in New York City. In 1994, along with one of New York's leading orthopedic surgeons, he co-founded and directed Metro Sports Med, a private physical therapy clinic located in New York Methodist Hospital in Brooklyn, which now has multiple locations throughout the NYC area. In June of 1998, Fred co-founded and established Serious Strength, Inc., a slow burn personal train and rehabilitative exercise center in New York City. Wow. In 2015, he expanded into New Jersey. His clients include top CEOs, celebrities, best-selling authors, journalists, and TV personalities, including Tony Robbins, Cynthia Nixon, and Dr. Max Gomez, and many others. Fred is the co-author of The Slow Burn Fitness Revolution and author of Strong Kids, Healthy Kids. Let's give a round of applause for Fred on. So, yeah, so the first thing I want to say is thank you to Debbie, um, especially for, like, enduring the litany of, like, crazy emails. I'm like, where's the bus? <laughs> like, I can't figure things out for myself. Um, but thank you, Debbie. And, yes, this is, um, I'm really honored to come back the third time. And I, I also wanted to say where's my note, that um, the speakers this year so far, everyone has, has been fantastic. This is really been an amazing yeah. series of speakers this year. Yeah. And, um, oh, I forgot to press, uh, see what's happening? My daughter said, it's better video too. All right, so I know we have one here, but I'm doing it for her. She wants to see it right away. So, um, so uh, oh, and I was thinking, I, I put it there and I couldn't find it. I was like, I was like where's my phone? Where's my phone? And then I was thinking about Dr. Boz's speech. Because my HbA1c has always been like 5.5, 5.6, and I'm like, am I experiencing advanced lactation? <laughs> <laughs> like, no! <laughs> so, um, so what I want to do today is make sure that, um, so I have a presentation, about 40 some odd slides, but it's very important to me whenever I give these talks, because sometimes talking about exercise is like a deer in the head. And people, I'll say things, and what I what I want to avoid is me saying something, and then moving on, and having you all sit there in the audience going, "What did he say?" Because then you can't hear my next uh, slide. So it, stop me if I if I didn't make sense. I'll answer the question, and then we'll just um, go forward. Um, so, oh, and I put some flyers out, and um, inside the flyers is a comp complimentary slow burn session. So if you're in New York City, and you have that flyer, uh, you could have a complimentary session with me. I, I only had 20, so. Okay, I don't know how to do this. All right. Um, So, uh, as others have said, I have full disclosure, I've written a couple of books, I own two personal training facilities, and I'm here to tell you, you don't make any money writing books. So, it's, uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, and, um, oh, and now I just wanted, this is, um, this is just for fun. I just had this done, and I'd like to know what you guys think. It's real short. Are you looking for a safe and effective exercise program that delivers incredible results, and in just 30 minutes a week? At Slow Burn Personal Training, we've been doing just that for 21 years. Our method is a slow motion, total body strengthening program that improves your muscular strength, flexibility, endurance, and even de-ages you at the genetic level, all in one exercise program. Along with our safe and effective strengthening method, we advocate a low sugar, adequate protein, 
Intermittent fasting eating plan that never asks you to count calories or eat foods that only a hamster would eat. We measure your results with a state-of-the-art in-body device, so your results are fully guaranteed. You'll lose several pounds of fat per month and increase your lean mass, feeling strong and powerful in no time. So, reform your body, transform your life at Slow Burn Personal Training Studios. So, that is, um... Was it corny? Was it corny? Oh, yeah. uh, well, thanks, thanks for enduring it. Um, so the, the, the big thing I want to talk about is uh, I'm not an expert in nutrition. I know a little bit about it, but I, but I am, I think, knowledgeable about um, exercise. And um, one of the things that people really underestimate is the importance of muscle. Very much so. And, um, and as Bernard McFadden said, weakness is a crime. And I'm going to talk specifically about how this happens to us and what you can do to reverse this pretty, pretty quickly. And in fact, you see the center picture there. That was considered, and on the left is Bernard McFadden. And in the center is a woman who won the uh, most perfect female physique contest back in 1904. Uh, and on the right hand side, same person. So I think a lot of the times what we look at today as what is perfection and what is how we should be is just simply, it just simply isn't true. Especially with men. Like when I was a kid, my G.I. Joe dolls were like normal men. Now buy a G.I. Joe doll and it looks like this hulk of a person. It's, and it, it, I don't think it's a very healthy thing for young boys or young girls to, to see that. Um, you know what I mean? It's just not, it's just, it's just not good. Um, so, um, raise your hand. How many people right now are currently doing some form of weightlifting or strength training? That's pretty good. Um, how long, uh, raise your hands again. I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. So, for how, how long have you been doing it for? About three months. Excellent. Um, that's excellent. Who here has been doing it for two years or more on a pretty consistent basis? You don't count, Coach. Uh, three years or more. You don't count you. Oh, this is fantastic. Four years or more. Five years or more. This is fantastic. Six years or more. Seven. Ten. Oh wow, I don't have that. I didn't think so many people were going to hold their hand up at that spot. So I'm going to pick a winner. <laughs> like, I, didn't, I didn't bring one for everybody. Can you catch? It's a nice tote bag. But I want to commend everybody in here who's been doing it for three months or for longer because that's an extremely important part, and I'm going to get to it in a second, a part of your, um, of your life. The thing about exercise is, is that if you are not actively making yourself stronger, you are actively becoming weaker. There's no such thing in life as stasis. Nothing stays the same. So it's a, this is a very important thing to concept to understand. And a lot of people, I have a lot of clients who say, oh, I just can't do it. I mean, you know, I have to be in shape before I start getting in shape. Um, <laughs> But as Henry Ford said, that it's just, it's your thoughts, as Coach was saying, your thoughts create emotions. And emotions create actions. So, as Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, either way, you're right. So it's good to think that you can, and I'm going to show you how easy it is, because all of you, those of you who are not yet doing it, you can and this is a, a, a statement that a, a teacher of mine in college once said, and it, I never forgot it. And this is a very important thing. So all of the, the quote-unquote failures that you've had, what you didn't do in the past, the past is gone. It doesn't exist. All that exists is right now. And right now is the future. So forget about the things you didn't do, you couldn't do. doesn't make any difference. Just let it go. Now, just briefly, the reason why I'm going to bring up nutrition not being an expert in it, but to bring it up is because no matter what exercise 
program you do, whether it's mine, coat, it doesn't make any difference. If your nutrition isn't in order, it's not going to do you much good. So it's very important to make sure. Now, if you look here, this is something that I created to kind of like appease most of my clients. Because if I put animal protein and almost nothing else, they'd walk out of my gym. It's just unacceptable. This is hard enough <laughs> for people to for people to accept. So, um, but by and large, um, eating most of your what's most of on your plate should be some kind of protein. Um, and Dr. Sai was talking about this, like the, the human body doesn't doesn't do math. So. Whenever, if anybody ever tells you that, oh, you got to count calories, calories count, they, they don't know, like Dr. Sai said, they don't know what the, you know what they're talking about. Because fat loss and muscle gain, it's not a numbers game of calories. It's, a, it's completely a hormonal game. And how you eat eating healthfully is going to affect your hormonal milieu. So, with protein, did I do that too fast? Um, how much do you need? So there's good research by Dr. Uh, Volek, uh, Dr. Feynman, and a bunch of other um, actual experts in nutrition who say that you should be getting around one gram of protein. And this is where a lot of trainers, uh, well-meaning trainers and, and other uh, people get it wrong. It's not a gram of protein per pound of body weight. Because if you weigh 400 pounds, you certainly shouldn't be eating 400 grams of protein. <laughs> right? It's a gram of protein per pound of lean body weight. So, for example, uh, if you're typically in, uh, in my gym, when we use that in-body device that you saw, um, a woman who is around 5 foot 6 and weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of 170, 80 pounds, who needs to be about 140 pounds, let's say, she will typically start out with about 70 pounds to 80 pounds of lean body mass. So I would suggest to that client that she strive to get about 60, 70. You can overshoot the protein landing gear. That's fine. Go ahead. Try it. Eat all you like. Um, and um, that, can be, that can be measured either by a DEXA machine or it can be measured by doing circumference, there's many different ways. It would take too much time for me to explain it now, but it's per pound of lean body weight. So for example, on the in-body machine, I weigh, my lean body, I weigh 180, my lean body weight is 160. So I strive to get 160 pounds, uh, 160 grams of, <laughs> I'd like to try that. <laughs> um, rip on it. Uh, per um, per day. So a lot of people think that's impossible, I can't do it, but actually it's not that difficult. And I think all of you kind of know this already, but just a regular hamburger is almost 30 grams of protein right there. That's half your protein you need in a day right there. So it's really not difficult, um, especially if you're not eating what I call crapohydrates. If you're not eating that stuff, it's really not that difficult to get the protein you need. I have vegetarians and vegans who come into my gym, and they say, "Oh, Fred, I, you know, you're, you know, I, I, I have my own science about this, and you know, and the truth of the matter is, I try to explain to them as gently as I can that your physiology doesn't give up about your philosophy. You need the amino acids that you need, and they're best derived from animal sources." So, and you guys know this, this is what your meals might look like, something of this nature. And this I don't have to explain because you all know this, you've got to keep your sugar carb intake low so that your insulin stays low, so that your body understands that you want it to use body fat as its main source of fuel. So you're, you have to speak that, lang that language to your body or your body won't understand. So before we talk, I was talking about the importance of muscle. So, it's not weight loss. So if I chop my arm off, I'll weigh less. <laughs> well, that won't do. Um, you can, and one of the, 
reasons why I use that in-body device is because I'll have a woman come into the gym who weighs 160 pounds. She will start to eat healthfully and strength train with me once or twice a week. And um, in a month, she'll still weigh the same. Or but not really a month. In two months, she'll weigh the same. Because she's lost 10 pounds of fat and gained 10 pounds of lean. So she'll get on the scale and go, this program sucks. <laughs> and then I'll show her. And, and even when, because when you're, if you're, as I call it, if you're very over fat, sometimes losing 10 pounds of fat, you don't really feel it very much. You don't notice it very much. But to lose 10 pounds of fat and gain 10 pounds of lean, it, the, the difference is dramatic in how you feel. Okay, this is a mind blower, and uh, the truth of the matter is this. Exercise, no matter my slow burn, fast burn, no matter what you do, exercise does not affect fat loss much, if at all. In fact, I calculated for a client once that if they wanted to burn one single pound of body fat by doing physical activity, they would have to walk from New York City to Hartford, Connecticut, and back to lose one pound of body fat. And the math is it's 38 hours to walk to Hartford, Connecticut. You burn about 60 to 80 calories per hour. So you'll walk there and you'll burn 2,300 some odd calories, but you have to subtract the amount of calories you would have burned in that time doing nothing. I go, you're all sitting here burning calories, right? So you have to subtract. So when you get on a treadmill and it says, oh, I burned 1,000 calories in an hour of pouring sweat, it's 1,000 calories minus the amount of calories you would have burned anyway doing nothing, and those calories are not coming from your fat stores. They're primarily coming from intramuscular glycogen, which is good, but it's not mobilizing your fat stores. And then all you got to do is eat a banana, and it's back. <laughs> now, some people get angry. They go, oh, you're telling me that if I do aerobic exercise, I'm stupid. Right, Fred? No. no. I'm, I'm saying exactly what I said, not what you're thinking I said. <clears throat> What's that? That's right. That is right. Thoughts lead to emotions. Emotions lead to actions. And you can change... Except in rare circumstances, you can change the way you think about anything, any time you want to. It's here. Thank you for reminding me. So, yes, it, it, you like to take a walk in the park, you ride your bike, that's all good. That's all, and I'm going to explain the difference. But weightlifting or strength training or resistance training, there's many different ways to call it, that should be the focus of every single person's exercise. If you're human, that should be the focus of your exercise program. Oh, I have this. I keep forgetting I have this. Um, so, now, the great thing about strength training is it gives you all of the benefits, all, all of the health benefits that exercise can bestow. It gives you all the health benefits that would make your doctor happy upon a routine physical exam. Not only that, but it improves mood, cognitive function, and anybody, and if there's anybody here who's skeptical about what I'm saying, I'd be happy to provide you with some of the research and the papers on this to, uh, to show you. But it, it is, and so that's why I say it should be the focus, because it gives you everything. It'll give you cardio. It'll give you flexibility. It'll give you strength. It'll increase your metabolic rate. So, it's a win-win. So now, the difference here, I write this in my book, is <laughs> there's a difference between exercise, which is what I call something that you do that causes a positive tissue adaptation. If it's to be called exercise, it has to result in a positive tissue adaptation. More muscle, more bone, more mitochondria. If it, if it doesn't, if that's not the purpose of it, then it isn't exercise, it's recreation. It's a pastime activity, which is good. 
but they are two separate and distinct things. I already said that. I doubled up the sign. So, what's nice about this is, it doesn't make it, if you're a runner and you strength train, you will run better. If you're a tennis player, you will play tennis, you'll hit the ball harder, and you'll have more endurance. And if you're a golfer, you'll crush the ball. There, if you're picking up your grandkids, it'll feel like the kid lost 15 pounds. <coughs> so, anything you do in life will be made better by strength training. Now, I have a lot of people say to me, oh, Fred, I don't need your silly, slow stuff. I play tennis four times a week. No, no. The tennis is not going to replace the strength training. It's the other way around. By strength training, you're going to improve your tennis game. So uh, people will say, well, Fred, something is better than nothing. And I say to them, could be, but if that something is nothing, then it's not. <laughs> I just make it up. <laughs> All right, nitty gritty, down to the nitty gritty. So, what happens when we do, when we exercise? Basically, whether you're doing pull ups on a tree branch or you're in my gym doing slow burn, regardless, what you're actually doing is you're creating more little fibers within the belly. So, if, if this the big part in the back is an arm or a leg. Within that belly of the muscle are fibers, and within the fibers are little fibers, little itty bitty ones called myofibrils. And those are what you're creating more of. So again, whether you're doing weightlifting in my gym or you're doing calisthenics out in the park, that's what's actually happening. So when people say, oh, I want to get toned, or what, what the, the word tone is, the biological term is tonus, and it just means the state of resting tension. So this has more tonus than a pillow. So the more little myofibrils you have in your, in your arm, the more muscle tone you will have. So if you, if you squeeze an elderly person's arm, it's really soft because of all of the myofibrils that she has lost. If you grab a bodybuilder's arm, it feels like concrete because of, they're packed with so many myofibrils in the fibril. Are there any questions? On, is, that, is that clear? That that's the benefit you get to? What's that? Yeah, yeah. Yes? I noticed in some of these photos that you have one time red hair. So if I started. <laughs> Okay. Uh, coach, would you like it? <laughs> well, the truth is, <laughs> bald is better. That's right. The truth is that um, you, when you when you strength train, you will actually increase testosterone. However, women cannot improve increase their testosterone to the point where you'll look like me. So you got nothing to worry about. <laughs> In fact, the drugs that men take in order to grow their hair back, are estrogenic. Okay. Right, so uh, I had a doctor on the, oh, it was on the first low-carb cruise, it was a doctor talking about, um, uh, I didn't agree with, at the time, um, uh, hormone replacement therapy, and then this doctor was talking to me about it, and he taught me a lot of lessons about it, and he said, see, you're bald, you're balding, and I said, yeah, he goes, you're lucky, because that means your testosterone level is more than likely higher than average. I was like, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, here's the thing. You see people in the gym, especially upstairs in the gym I saw, that when you're lifting weights, doing push-ups, when you um, begin the first repetition, you are only recruiting what's called the slow twitch, or oxidative muscle fibers. These little ones on the left-hand side. When you're on your second, and so it's easy, the effort is easy. Now you do a second repetition, and we'll talk about what slow means, a third repetition. Now you're recruiting both the slow twitch, the guys on the left, 
what I call the marathon runners, and the ones in the middle, which I call the, triath the triathletes. So only when you exercise to the point where another repetition, whether you're doing bodyweight squats or you're doing a biceps curl, it doesn't make any difference what exercise you're doing. If you don't take that exercise to the point where you feel as if you cannot do another one, slowly and safely, and we'll get to that, then you're never recruiting the, what the so-called fast twitch or sprinter muscle fibers on the end. And those are the fibers that are most responsible for your strength. So you'll see typical bodybuilders will say, oh, well, do uh, five sets of ten. Well, why not just do one set of 12 to the point where the 11th and 12th was impossible and you just cut to the chase? There's no point in wasting time doing multiple sets not to fatigue. This is called Henneman's size principle. We don't get to vote. This is how muscles contract. This is it. So if you're, if you're exercising submaximally, you're never getting to those fast twitch, most important muscle fibers. Any questions on that? Yes? So then you should start with a higher weight, or, you know, you should try to do less. If, if you reach to that, when you get to that point. If you do a rep. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to reps. that. Okay. Yeah, I'll get, yes, you're right. What you would then do is, if you did 10, right. and the next time you could do 12, then you'd make the, increase the resistance a little tiny bit. I'll talk about that in a second. I hope I can get through. So complete fatigue of the muscle is the goal, not necessarily finishing a repetition. So I had a question when I was at dinner. Like a woman asked me, she said, "Well, I'm, I think she said I'm 63 and my husband's 67. Do you think that at our age we could build muscle?" And the answer is, anyone can build muscle tissue at any age. Uh, my daughter, who was on the cover of the Strong Kids Healthy Kids book, she started strength training when she was six, and she's 23 now. And she's been strength training ever since then. So if you look on the top, that's a cutaway of a thigh. And that's a 40-year-old athlete that lifts weights. This is, I picked this out of a study that I read. The bottom is a 70-year-old athlete that lifts weights. Can anybody tell the difference? The one in the middle is a 70-year-old sedentary, 74-year-old sedentary person. All the white is fat. You see, and the red is what's left of his or her muscle, his. And inside, you see the bone in the center? You see how much the bone in the, in the middle slide has wasted away? And how much denser it is on the top two? So, no matter what your age is, it doesn't make any difference. You can build muscle and build strength. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people say, well, if I'm going to do my strength training, I also have to do my cardio. That is false. Strength training is cardio. So I'll say to people, well, when you lift weights and you get stronger, what happens? Well, you build more muscle fibers. Great. Okay, so I'm out of shape. I can't run three blocks without getting out of breath. Now I do an aerobics class. I do whatever it is I do. And now I can go three miles and I feel great. Okay, what happened? What got better? Most people say, oh, my heart got stronger. No. Uh, you didn't grow a third lung. <laughs> What actually happens is, <laughs> sure, I'm not a doctor, you've caused, you've proliferated, created more little energy producing organelles called mitochondria within the muscle cell. And the next slide shows you, on the left is a picture, you see the, the uh, center mitochondrion, the mitochondria? The mitochondria live, so to speak, in and around the myofibrils. And the right-hand side is a cutaway slide of an actual uh, muscle fiber. You see the myofibrils and the mitochondria surrounding it? So the more myofibrils you create, the more mitochondria you will create. And the more mitochondria you create, the more wind, the more stamina, the more endurance, or whatever noun you want to use, will be created. And this is why when runners strength train, they become better runners. 
way back when it was thought, oh, just make people muscle bound. We know today that that is absolutely not the case. Any athlete, that endurance athlete that strength trains, improves their endurance capacity. I put this in for fun. I show this to my clients when I give the initial consultation. And that woman there who's holding the weight up, her name was Pudgy Stockton. And she died at about 100 years old, about, I'm not sure, maybe half a decade ago. And uh, she um, pioneered weight, like one of the female pioneers for um, teaching women that strength training is good for you and that it doesn't turn you into a man. It just makes you a better woman. Uh, so, uh, so, if you're strength training properly, you don't need cardio. And if you enjoy cardio, if you like running, if you like jogging, great. It's going to make that better. But you don't have to. There are a lot of people whose hobbies are building models, reading, chess. And when you say, oh, you've got to be physically active, they say, I don't want to be physically active. I don't like being physically active. Thank you very much. So if you're strength training properly once or twice a week, I absolve you. <laughs> and no, I'm, I'm not a minister. <laughs> stretching. So, when you stretch, stretching, the, the term muscular flexibility is kind of a misnomer. There's no such thing as muscular flexibility. Muscles contract and lengthen. Joints flex and extend. So when people say, um, Flex your muscle, you're not, you're flexing your elbow. You're contracting your muscle. So the whole concept of muscular flexibility is not what most people think it is. You cannot increase the length of a muscle into the non contractile properties of the tendon. I know the, the Pilates, what was, what was it? Mari Windsor of Windsor Pilates had this infomercial and said, Oh, I bought you. Haven't you always wanted to have the long, lean muscles of a dancer? Well, now you can with Windsor Pilates. No, you can't. <laughs> you have to be born that way. And that's why when people say athletes are not born, not made, well, they are born, and when they do their, act, their activities, then they make themselves capable. But not everybody is capable of being a Michael Jordan. If every single kid who plays basketball said, I'm going to be Michael Jordan, and they had the willpower, this is still not going to happen. So, but that doesn't mean you can't make yourself better. So when you're strength training properly, you are going to increase the joint's ability to move through time and space because muscles move joints. So the stronger your muscles become, the more extendable or flexible your joints will become. So you don't have to stretch if you're strength training properly throughout a full range of motion. And often people will say, well, you know, when I stretch, I feel really good. I get up in the morning and I do this and I do this and I feel great. So again, you're not stretching. You're contracting. When you do this, you're contracting your back. When you do this, you're contracting your chest. Like when you see a cat doing on a sofa. That's not stretching. That's contracting, and that's what you do when you're lifting weights. That's what feels good, getting blood into the muscles. Now, Coach said, and he was right, when you're exercising, exercise is a controlled detriment. That makes sense? It's a controlled detriment. The benefits of exercise come when you're resting, not when you're exercising. So, if you exercise on a Monday, there, and this slide shows, this is, I put this kind of a crummy slide that I put together of about half a dozen, no, no, a dozen or more studies that show how long does it take the muscle to recover from an exercise program. And it takes roughly 24 to 48 hours to fully recover, and about 48 to 72 hours before you actually, your body actually creates, improves, makes more myofibrils, mitochondria. If you're constantly exercising, you're constantly in a state of detriment. So remember that exercise, the benefits come when you're not exercising. On days you're not active, remember we talked about what is exercise? Something that causes a positive tissue adaptation. I'm not talking about going for a walk 
or going for a bike ride, or going for a swim. That's separate from exercise. So really what you want to do, because it's a controlled detriment, you want to discover the least amount of exercise you require. Not the most you can withstand. And people will, you know, have, and I'm not bragging or boasting, but people say, oh, Fred, they come to the gym and they'll say, well, well, what do you do for exercise? I'm like, I do this. I do exactly what you do. Like, <laughs> well, the, the, right. Well, the thing about we'll you know we'll talk about later is really it, how you eat. Really, remember I said at the beginning how you eat really makes a difference. It really does. So now slowly. So when you're in the gym and you're lifting weights, you want to make sure that you're lifting slowly. There is no benefit whatsoever to lifting a weight quickly, unless you want to get injured. So. What we teach in the gym is two to, so if you're doing an exercise like a, like a chest press, you want to take two to three seconds for the first inch of movement. So, and I'm going to show, I'm going to give you an example in one second. Um, you don't want to have any rest in between the repetitions. You want to lift slowly, lower slowly, and continue in that fashion until you reach that point of momentary muscular success, where you really feel that you truly cannot do another one. Then, and as we discussed, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Um, Frank. Right, as, we, as Frank was asking, so once you can do a certain amount of repetitions, what do you do? Then you can make the weight slightly heavier. And I call it micro-loading. Because if you do the math, if, if a, think of it this way, if a 20-year-old can bench press 100 pounds, 10 times slowly, and he adds one pound to the bar, that's it. You won't even feel the difference. And if he trains twice a week, that's two pounds per week. That's 100 pounds at the end of the year. So now at the end of one year of strength training, he's bench pressing 200 pounds for 10 repetitions. That is powerful. What's he doing at the end of five years? No, he's not. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> In about a year or two, you will maximize, if you do it right, the amount of strength that you can uh, that you can acquire. And then for the rest of your life, you're just maintaining that level of strength. So here, I think this is a, a demo. Now it started without you seeing the start, but you'll see it on the next row. This is a client of mine, Dr. Parada, been training with me for about 15 years, 17 years. Now it looks like she's not doing anything. The weight that you can't see on this particular exercise she's using now is 220 pounds. You see how slow she started? And that, yes, in the background you hear a metronome that I use a second, just to give people the tempo. What you won't see is her continuing to the point of fatigue because it was, she'd be in, she's in the machine for about 90 seconds or so which is about what you want, a minute to a minute and a half of effort until you reach deep fatigue. That's what the research seems to show works quite well. And this way the weight is never heavy. And that's what's nice about the slow reps is you don't have to use a heavy weight for the weight to feel heavy. So, a lot of people, you know, we wonder why well, I can't, you know, there's too much to do, I gotta do aerobics, I gotta stretch, I gotta lift weights, I gotta too many things. You literally, everyone in this room could go upstairs to the gym in, in, the, in the ship and you could be in and out of the gym in about 15, 16 minutes and do a full body productive exercise by doing these basic simple exercises. Could you do more? Sure. There are other things you could do like a lower back exercise, but to start out, especially for those of you who haven't been doing any strength training, this is a very simple way to do it and... As Coach said, if you read my book, <laughs> it makes it it makes it very simple. I didn't bring any copies because I, I thought it was just too heavy to bring. So, um. <laughs> got that right. <laughs> so, one question at dinner was, well, when could you start? With, when should a person start? You should start right now. And the question was, well. Um, I'm on, I'm changing the way I eat. Shouldn't I lose a certain amount of weight before I strength train? No. 
In fact, you should do the opposite. You should start strength training right away so that the weight you do lose will only be fat. You want, to, you want discriminate fat, uh, weight loss. And you want it to just come from body fat. So the quicker you build muscle, the faster you'll ensure that the weight that you do lose is only body fat. So you can. So a question always is, well, what can I expect? Men and women, you can lose about approximately one to two pounds of fat per week if you're eating healthfully and strength training. You cannot lose more than that. So patience is a virtue. I've, I've been doing this now for 30 years, and I have never seen anybody lose more than two pounds of fat, not weight, of fat per week. It takes time. Women can build about five to 10 pounds of uh, lean mass, which is muscle and bone, in roughly three to six months, if you're eating healthfully. And men can, of course, gain a little bit more. And it just depends on, it depends on the men, depends on the women. Woman, some women build muscle easily. Some men don't. So it really isn't a male or female thing, but in general, this is what I have seen um, with my clients. Uh, on the left is Grace. Grace wanted to summit Everest, and she came to me, and I said, yeah, strength train with me once or twice a week. Don't do anything else. She said, that's impossible. Well, there she is on base camp. And uh, they didn't reach the summit because of the weather. But she was on her way. And that's just another, uh, on the right-hand side, just typical clients of mine who have done what you're doing, added strength training into their life, and it just, it's like low-carb, ketogenic eating, carnivore eating, in combination with strength training, like exercise, but specifically strength training, is, is like the dynamic duo. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get any better. So real quick, I have four and a half minutes left. This is a typical client of mine. She, was in a, she admitted she's a um, crapohydrate addict. <laughs> and uh, she began, this is a four month, right, 12, this is a four month time period. And you can see she could have done better, but she did pretty good. And look at her uh, body fat mass from 65.8 pounds down to 52. But look on the right hand side. Look at her, vis the visceral fat is the dangerous fat. It's the brown gooey stuff. You need some of it around your organs, but too much of it, um, this is not a correct way to say it, but it kind of chokes and squeezes your organs. It's not healthy to have too much visceral fat. On my machine, the doctors that created the algorithm said number 10 is, is maximum. She started out with 15. So she was way into this ain't no good amount of visceral fat. And within this four month period, she's got it down to 11. So she's, I think she's almost at 10 now, which is at an okay level. Now, um, for another door prize, who can tell me why her lean body mass fluctuated from 97 down to 95, back up to 97, down to 96, back up to 98? Why did her first person to raise their hand? Yes. Because her overall weight fluctuated and her lean to fat fluctuated. Not exactly. Did anybody else? Yes. Hormone. Water? No. Nope. Hormone. Um, that can affect it, definitely. But that's not the real reason why her lean body mass fluctuated. Remember, she was strength training consistently, once or twice a week. Anybody else have any idea why she, her her lean body mass fluctuated? Yes. Super diet. And specifically? Uh, so because <laughs> no, no, you were on the right track. <laughs> she burned carbs and not fat. Anybody else? Why? <laughs> yes. She had a big uh, celebration party right there. <laughs> Actually, she did. She went on vacation. No, but what is the real reason why she her lean body mass kept fluctuating? Anybody? What's that? She ate carbs. She had to eat carbs. She wasn't eating 
No, she was strength training consistently the whole time. Yes. That was similar. No, no, there's someone. You're all missing it. Don't you want a tote bag? They're really nice. They're like rope handle. You're close. So why did her, why did her lean body mass fluctuate like that? Uh, she was, but that's not the reason why her lean body, like why didn't her lean body mass just go up, 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 up? Like her fat went down, 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 down. She was consistent with her carbohydrate reduction. Consistent. So her body fat went down, 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 down. But why did her lean body mass go up, 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 up,